Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. We talk a lot about anxiety and worry in kids on this podcast. Actually, this whole season of the podcast is about tools that can help you raise emotionally strong and worry-free kids. But what about you? We know you may be dealing with your own worry, too, which is why we're excited to tell you about a tool you can use to help with anxiety and stress. The Abide, Sleep, and Pray meditation app is the number one Christian meditation app that's proven to reduce stress, improve sleep, and deepen your connection to God so you can experience His peace. I found it super easy to use, David, and I even told some older adolescents about it this week. I love that, which makes it so simple to add into your routine every day. And with Abide's premium subscription, you get ad-free meditation, plus early access to more content, background music customization, a sleep timer, and even a journal to record your progress, which we love journals. We do. And you know how they say you should put your own oxygen mask on before helping your kids? Yeah, the same goes for this. If you take any of our advice from this episode, start with this. Download the Abide app today and boost your mental, physical, and spiritual health. Right now, we have a special offer for listeners of Raising Boys and Girls when you subscribe. Get 25% off your first year when you sign up for the premium subscription, but only if you use our promo code RBG. Don't wait. Download Abide, Sleep, and Pray Meditation today and use our promo code RBG to get 25% off. So when we think about our years... David and my years practicing with kids and families. This is my 30th. This 25th. is your 25th. There is a name that we have talked about in our offices all of these years that is one of like the highest, most respected psychiatrists in town that we have yes. referred. I mean, we were laughing. I really bet we've referred thousands of kids to you or tried to. <laughs> You're so great that so often we can't get them in. But Dr. Jerry Fitzpatrick, I mean, you have made such a mark on, and I can't even imagine the lives you've saved, the hope that you brought into kids and families' lives, and the kids I've worked with in common with you. I just am so grateful. And so when we started talking about experts, you were one of the first people we wanted to ask, come on, this season. You are kind. Well, I am truthful, honest. We would say the same thing. 100% truthful. Yeah, we just talked about how many... Families have sat in one of the offices of this house we're in right now and wept at times Mm. talking about the gift you've been to their family. So to get to reflect that back to you today is a real gift to us. That was really touching for me to hear that. Thank you. Very true. And will you tell a little bit about, I mean, I'd be curious even how you became a psychiatrist. So really, technically, I guess this is 31 years that I've been after finishing residency. I was about to say, it took you a little longer to get trained than it did me. It (laughs) was a a a little prolonged. Yes. (laughs) Well, I initially planned to be a child neurologist because in my past life, I had been an EEG tech, did brainwave tests, and actually worked at the old Vanderbilt Hospital many years ago. But I had had several experiences in my pediatric residency that had had a pretty profound impact on me Mm. in pediatric oncology, where that was so difficult and felt very attached to the patients and the parents and what a journey they were on. And then in the emergency room with trauma, Mm. kids that would come in with a lot of abuse in inner city, it was tough. And all of those things, I think, went together that when push came to shove, I thought, I'm going to do child psychiatry. So I accepted a position for training here at Vanderbilt and came and did adult psychiatry, then child psychiatry fellowship, and then stayed at Vanderbilt for a couple of years on faculty, 
went into private practice uh, along the way, went back to Vanderbilt briefly for just part time. I remember because we couldn't get anybody in. That's Cuban. right. <laughs> then that was really, that's <laughs> we could right. Chronicle I did this that for, for about five years. <laughs> yes. And then uh, came back into full time private practice. So I think it honestly fit me better to be a child psychiatrist, mm. to tell you the truth. I think we're all geared in a certain direction, Mm. and that was where I was geared. You were geared. So all these years of working with kids, what would you say are some of the primary struggles you're seeing with kids today in your offices? It's so funny. In some ways, kids present with the same things in many ways that they presented with 30 years ago, Mm. meaning I see a lot of anxiety. I see depression, sometimes with suicidal ideation trauma, Mm. attentional difficulties, school struggles, social problems, Mm -hmm. the interactions with peers, family conflicts. I also see kids who are on the spectrum, various developmental disabilities. I saw kids like this 30 years ago, too. Mm. But I think it is fair to say that over time, maybe kids haven't changed that much and parents haven't changed that much. It's our environment has changed. And our culture has changed. Mm. And so I think the new things have come up because of that, Mm. which number one, I would say, is media. It's become such a phenomenal part of our lives. And it has changed the flavor of the presentations, Mm. I think. Mm. That's a great description. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some things are the same. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us would say in the field The intensity is greater. Mm. Many years ago, actually, psychiatric hospitalization, when I first went into practice, kids did go into the hospital. We go in for a month or two months or three months, and we would see them And when we were in training for an hour of therapy a day. It was a very different treatment program, Mm -hmm. what we did. There was a lot more psychotherapy during hospitalization. So everything has changed in that regard. Mm -hmm. And so the acuity of what we see on an outpatient basis now is different Mm -hmm. than what we saw years ago. It makes sense. Yes, it does make sense. And yet some things stay the same. I just took a trip with my kids to France and Italy and visiting Rome. And you look at the history and you say to yourself, history does repeat itself, Mm -hmm. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I suspect similar problems were there back then too. Very true. Great observation. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. But how you deal with them is very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the way you talked about that of as the environment has changed and having all the wisdom and perspective that you do for practicing all those years As the environment has changed, how have you seen kids and parents change over the years? I think what's been really interesting, certainly when I was growing up, and obviously I'm older than you guys, but I wonder if there were some similarities, meaning there were sort of different expectations. Mm -hmm. If you were involved in sports, it was unusual if they came to your practice or game, right? Yes. Because everybody was busy doing what they did. There was a lot more, I guess, independence is the best Mm -hmm. way to put it. Mm -hmm. Parents were less involved in some respects, less involved in school. I think what has changed over time is parents are much more involved in everything, really. And so the good news of that is, is that they're more involved and seem express more interest in what's going on in their children. And they want to go to their games and they want to participate. But what's also maybe on the downside is sometimes it's hard for kids to learn certain things without some just independence with safety. So all of that has gotten complicated in many respects. So we've seen positives with all of the involvement and some negatives. So there's Mm. a bit more, sometimes I think kids haven't learned how to problem solve in the same way that maybe you did years ago because you were thrown into it. (laughs) And now sometimes as parents, and I've been guilty too, by the way, so please, I don't want anybody to take this as a criticism. We try to fix everything for our kids. And in doing that, I feel like they've missed out on some steps. We all fail. We all have difficulties. And we have to learn to 
tolerate failure, move through it, learn from it, pick ourselves up, which is obviously what kind of defines resiliency and so on. And I think it's a little harder to come by than it used to be because more recent generations of parents have tried to do more to step in and protect their kids. Maybe they didn't have a lot of encouragement, right? Right. And so now they want to encourage Mm -hmm. their kids. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that pendulum swing. Mm -hmm. So it's the balance. How do you balance things? Maybe we'll get to a balanced place. Maybe we swung one way and now the other, and now we're going to come back, I hope. Yeah, I do too. So if you had to say big picture, two or three top things you feel like kids really need from parents today, what would you say? Well, I'm going to say something that'll sound probably a little bit I don't know, a little mushy or hokey or whatever, but I'm going to say this. I think first and foremost, kids need to be secure in their parents' love, Mm -hmm. meaning that it's not going anywhere. Yes, they want to teach you to make good moral judgments, and there are certain things we should do and not do and kind of give you these limits and boundaries and so on. But the thing is, they need to know first and foremost That you love them and that they are secure in your love. And if they mess up or disagree with you on something, that you're still going to be there. So that's number one, I would say. That, to me, is huge. Mm -hmm. But then you move to also parents have got to give kids bumper guards and boundaries and limits. Mm -hmm. That's part of our job is trying to let our kids kind of explore and have some independence But with the safety of us backing them up, teaching them about boundaries, I think I didn't understand when I was a child. No, I think I was taught some of these things. I just didn't have terms for them. I didn't quite understand boundaries. Mm -hmm. As I got older and began to learn things, I discovered, you know, setting boundaries is tough. It is tough. It really is tough. And yet our kids, they almost beg for it, even though they wouldn't necessarily admit that. Mm -hmm. But they need that structure, Mm -hmm. those limits, those boundaries. And parents have to figure out which ones they're going to set. And then our next big goal is consistency, Mm. right? But that's also our hardest thing to achieve. I don't care who we are. But the more kids know what to expect from their parents, you know, if one day you let them do whatever and they have complete freedom, and then the next day you're in a bad mood and you tell them they can't do anything. Mm. It's such a mixed message. Mm -hmm. And so how can we strive to be more consistent Mm -hmm. and give them reasonable boundaries and limits and then stick to it and be consistent, but keep loving them Mm -hmm. even when they mess up. And we mess up, Mm. by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, as parents, we mess up. Yes. Security, boundaries, and consistency. Yeah. Those would probably be yes. the ones I think about yes. a lot. I mean, there are obviously other things, but mm-hmm. I think those are important if mm-hmm. kids have those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you for those reminders. This season of our podcast is focusing on raising emotionally strong and worry-free kids. And would love to just ask you, what do you think an emotionally strong child looks like? Well, I mentioned resiliency, Mm -hmm. okay? Really, again, I want to just define we're going to have difficult times all through life and as children, and we're going to have failures. One of the worst things you see is a child who somehow has sort of missed that along the way. And every now and again, like I saw it occasionally in medical school, where somebody had excelled in everything and they were not overly familiar with failure. (laughs) And all of a sudden, they had one, because it usually happens to all of us at some point. You just may not happen as early as others. And they didn't know what to do, didn't know how to handle it. So I feel like that is huge. And so how do we teach kids that? And I think we teach it by, first of all, allowing it to happen, you know, instead of trying to protect and hover and legislate what happens, you know, it's like really painful when your child doesn't make a team that they've worked so hard to be on. I know this, and it is very painful. But the answer is not to go and yell at the coach or 
you know, everybody's bad and that's just not the best way to deal with it. And what we need to do with that is just talk about a lot of times we have disappointments. Maybe we had a bad day and we didn't play our best or any number of things can go into that. But we have to learn to accept that and we have to grieve it. We have to grieve when we fail. That's hard. It's painful. And we've got to let our kids grieve. And then we've got to talk about what you learn from it. Hmm. What did you learn? How are you going to do things differently moving forward? And does this really have to define also who you are? So I think teaching kids that over and over and allowing that to happen and securing the love, supporting Hmm. them through it. I think sometimes as parents, we need to share things sometimes, but there are limits Mm. also to what Mm -hmm. we need to share. Mm -hmm. We don't need to get into the nitty gritty sometimes of choices we made or, you know, you have to use your judgment. Is this a good time to share a little more or not? Because you don't want to overwhelm your child. But I think kids need to know that as parents, we have failures too. Mm. And this is what we've done to try to cope with that and come back from it and learn from it. So I think if we talk about that, we model that for our kids, I think that's huge. Yeah. So resiliency to me is huge. Yeah. I think if we teach our kids to be as much as we can self-aware, you know, to try to examine, okay, I just had a conflict. Who who owns the problem here? Did that 50% of that belong to me? Did a hundred percent belong to me? Could I have, you know, 20%? What part did I play in that? And again, to try to sort of learn from that. I think a huge goal to me for children is to have empathy Mm -hmm. too and to be concerned about others and to show compassion and understanding and and love and really learn how to be empathetic and express that. It comes easier to some than others. There's no question. For some people, it's really hard. But I think, again, these are sort of ideals, sort of goals that, to me, these are the things that go into making you emotionally stronger Mm. and to get through a number of things. You know, another thing, I think we have to let kids explore a little bit too, like explore their creativity and support them in stepping outside the box, trying on something new Mm. and learning from that. Those are all the things that come to my mind quickly anyway. Such good things. David, why do you have your sunglasses on inside when we are recording a podcast? Because they make me look younger and I can't seem to take them off. (laughs) I get it. I have my pair of glasses on as well, and I clip on my sunglasses, but only when I go outside. Well, to each his own. (laughs) I get why you don't want to take them off. One pair, endless possibilities. Because who says glasses have to be boring? I mean, have you seen my leopard clip-ons? Look at that. You are clipping something on all day long. I know. You love them, don't you? I love them. I love how easy it is to order. Pairs virtual try-ons let you sample their wide variety of frame shapes right from your computer. Choose from a range of iconic base shapes starting at just $60, including the prescription. Are you sure your glasses are working? Check that number again. Did you just say $60 including prescription? Yes, I did. And beyond helping you craft a style that's yours, Pear wants to do some good. For every pair you buy, Pear provides glasses to a child in need. That's why I ordered two pairs of sunglasses, and I got my wife a pair, too, so we helped give away three pairs of glasses to kids in need. Well, yours look great, and it's hard to take you seriously (laughs) in these (laughs) ads, but I love that. Get glasses as ever-changing as you are with Pear. Go to PearEyewear.com slash Raising Boys and Girls for a special 15% off your first purchase. That's 15% off at PairEyewear.com slash Raising Boys and Girls for our listeners. We're talking about anxiety a lot this season also because we're all sitting with it in our offices a lot. A lot. So what would you say to parents whose kids are struggling with worry and anxiety? 
one of the biggest things is communication. If we just act like it's not there or we're in denial ourselves, that's not good. So we need to be talking with our kids. And then what's the most important piece of that is we need to be listening, right? And Mm -hmm. sometimes we forget to do that. We're pretty busy giving them advice and out of a good place Mm -hmm. because we are trying to protect them and keep them safe and teach them things. But sometimes if we just would listen more and really hear what they're going to say, validate for them, this is scary. This is frightening. I understand why that felt so bad to you. So sort of give that back and validate what their feelings are. I think that's really huge. So the communication you know, mm-hmm. piece, and I'm going to say this as a parent, especially when you have teenagers, mm-hmm. sometimes they don't respond well when we're trying to help them. Right. And they're really put off by it and they'll be I don't know, a little bit offensive or rejecting. Mm. Here you're trying to help them and they're rejecting you. And so our tendency is to want to withdraw and back up and say, fine, you work it out yourself. Mm -hmm. I've tried to help you. I can say as a parent, I regret every time that I've withdrawn because I felt a little bit hurt. And so I think we have to try not to personalize things Mm. so much. And I tell parents this over and over. That's hard. You're tired, you're working, and you're trying to help your child, and maybe they're disrespectful to you or they reject you. I just want to say, let them know you're there and Mm -hmm. hang in. You may need to give them some space. But these are all goals, Mm -hmm. I guess, is what I'm trying to say. They're goals, ideally. Yes. One of the things that we see so often with anxious kids is kids who we give them all the tools in the world And it does not matter. And the parents will come back and either there are parents who say it's not working Mm -hmm. because they're believing their child that maybe they're kind of trying them or the parent will say the child's not trying. Mm -hmm. What do you do in those scenarios? We we need perspective ourselves. Well, I find that pretty hard too, actually. But I have to remind myself too, some of us are a little more psychologically minded than Mm. others, right? And so some people are more, some kids are incredibly insightful and observant and they want to process and they do want to work on something. But other kids, their nature is just to avoid, escape, make it go away, Mm -hmm. want a quick fix. As a psychiatrist, I want to say sometimes people come in looking for that magic pill, yeah. to fix everything. And obviously, I prescribe medicine. I believe in it. There are times it's absolutely a helpful adjunct, but it is an adjunct, mm-hmm. meaning that we need to develop skills and work through things. What I have found, when I was a child fellow, I remember one of our older attendings who had been around for a long time who was teaching us child faculty, he would say to us over and over, when we would be so frustrated and we didn't feel like we were doing anything to help anybody because people weren't utilizing these skills Mm -hmm. and they were still complaining of the same things. And we would think, what's the point of continuing the treatment, really? Because nothing's happening. And he would just say to us, smile and say, it's all about the relationship. Mm -hmm. It's all about the relationship. And I remember at first when he would say this, thinking, It's surely about more than that. Come on, there's something you're not sharing with us that we could use to get the point of cross that you need to do this, this, and this to feel better and to get better. But I learned through the years, so much is about the relationship, meaning even when kids aren't doing the things we're suggesting and parents are frustrated, Mm -hmm. the kids are frustrated, I'm one of those people that's sort of willing to hang in. Some Mm -hmm. people are, some people aren't. And I have found that the longer you hang in, at some point, they're more likely to do it. Mm. You know what I mean? And I do think it's about the relationship. Mm. People not giving up on them, Mm -hmm. continuing to brainstorm. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can't do this, but could you do this? Could you try this? And over the course of time, I do think often things get better, and sometimes because of the relationship, meaning because you didn't give up, Mm -hmm. because you kept on and you explored this and you explored that and you tried this. I think kids appreciate that Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I really do think ideally we hang in with it, 
that's sort of my biggest recommendation. But we encounter it a lot, and it's just going to come easier for some than others. Mm. Yes, so true. Yes. What about when a parent finds that they're the one who is worrying? Mm. What would you say in that situation? So what's been so fascinating to me through the years is sometimes a parent will bring in a child and they're very concerned about the child's anxiety. Before I even meet the child, adolescents, I tend to meet with them first and Mm -hmm. then meet with parents. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with children, they're apprehensive. They want their parents to come in, and then maybe they want to step out, let the parent give me the history, and then they've settled enough to come back in. And so I'm flexible and do it in different ways. But what I'm really going to say about that is sometimes I feel anxiety just emanating from this yes. parent, oh. just, just coming from their yes. pores. Yes. Like, <laughs> like you can just feel they are about to you know, jump off the sofa. And Mm. I think, again, the best thing we can do in situations like that is, you know, when we have the opportunity, take a little history there and Mm -hmm. say, kind of give back to them. I can see that you're really worried. You're really frightened about Mm. what's going on. And I'm wondering how you're taking care of yourself. Mm. You know, sometimes parents are very open if you suggest, and sometimes they'll say, yes, I feel like I need to see somebody. And, you know, a lot of times you do. And having your own treatment, because anxiety, I think we all know this, is very contagious. When you're in a family where there's a lot of anxiety, chances are you're going to have more. Sometimes if a parent is so anxious they themselves sort of collapse, and then they don't model what they want to model for their Mm -hmm. child who's anxious, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think they really either need to have a few visits with us alone to kind of talk about this and maybe talk about, you know, should you talk to your doctor or could we refer you to a therapist Mm -hmm. for your treatment? And sometimes when parents actually do that, they actually find it even easier to support their child's treatment because they see how helpful yeah. treatment has been for them. And then they're less frightened to let their child see a therapist because sometimes parents are frightened of that. Mm-hmm. Or in my case, sometimes the medication piece too yes. comes up and they're so frightened about that. And so I do a lot of referring mm. for families. And sometimes it takes a family session or two to be able to recognize those things. But parents, if they're really anxious, they themselves really need to get that help because until they do. And your child can't be your therapist, by the way. (laughs) And sometimes that happens. Mm -hmm. You have such a close relationship, you start saying more things maybe than you should. And then kids already blame themselves. Like when parents have problems, like there's a divorce, there are financial struggles, any number of things, substance abuse. Kids blame themselves frequently. Mm. So I think if they even sense their parent is so anxious, I think sometimes they think it's their fault. Mm. And we have to remember that too. Mm. And that's another motivator for us to get our own treatment Mm. as parents. Mm -hmm. What do you wish every parent raising a child today knew? I actually have several thoughts about that. Good. One thing, it's okay to apologize. Mm. Let's say you're having a really rough day at work. You come home, your child hasn't jumped into their homework or whatever. You know you're frustrated by it. And the point is, is sometimes we all say things that we shouldn't say. We raise our voices when we shouldn't. And I think as parents, it's really good when appropriate to apologize and say, you know what? I'm sorry, I really am in a bad mood, and I shouldn't have snapped at you like that. Or something bigger. I look back on how I handled this, and I wish I had handled it in a different way. I think that models for kids that something really good to be able to learn how to apologize themselves. I also think they need to learn how to forgive. Sometimes you hold a lot inside about what a parent's done, One of the greatest things in life later down the road is if you can forgive your parents for some of the things they messed up with. Mm. I think if we model that and 
we teach parents, it's okay to apologize. So that's a big one in my mind. Another one I want to say, parenting, and we say this all the time, is probably the hardest job you'll ever have. Mm. Harder than anything you do at work. It's just incredibly hard. And you are going to mess up. And you are going to wish you had handled things in different ways. And sometimes kids will like to let you know that over (laughs) and over and over. And so I also want to say about that, as a parent, most of the time, I think parents try to do the best they can with what is going on. And maybe what they did wasn't the best thing. And sometimes they really beat themselves up tremendously. And then it's almost like they give up. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just not a good parent. I can't do it. Don't respond like that. Mm -hmm. You need to cut yourself a little slack and say, I messed up. If you need to apologize for something, fine. I think you should do that. But you've got to learn how to forgive yourself as a parent, too, and recognize my heart was in the right place. I was wanting to help and love and protect my child, and I messed up. So forgive yourself. And then, again, pick yourself up. What did you learn from it? Work really hard not to repeat those same things over and over. Mm -hmm. So to me, that one's huge about that sort of blame. And then I think the other thing I want to say really to parents is the more rigid we are, it causes us problems. And that doesn't mean we don't have to have limits and boundaries because I've already said that. But life, sometimes you begin to see it's a little more gray Mm. than you might have thought it was when you started out with parenting. You'll always hear parents say, I was so much harder on my firstborn, right? Because there was that rigidity and Mm. you had in your head what was right and wrong. And, you know, really sometimes with age, we begin to appreciate that every kid doesn't fit a box. The methods don't have to be the same for every child. And have some grace Mm. with your child, too, because there are a lot more grays. It's not quite so black and white. Mm. And then the last thing I try to tell parents over and over, because I am reminded of this over and over, and I've had this privilege. Since I've been in practice for 31 years, I've had some patients who I started seeing as little kids, and I still see them. Mm. You know, they have more chronic things Mm -hmm. like chronic anxiety, OCD, Mm -hmm. some form of, and I continue to see them. I always tell parents this, don't ever underestimate growth and development. Mm. Because so often that child that was really difficult, difficult temperament, oppositional, defiant, and sometimes, by the way, that's out of an anxious place or out of a depressed place. I rarely, maybe twice in my career, have I given a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder. And somebody may say to me, well, you've misdiagnosed if you haven't Mm -hmm. given that diagnosis more. But I find that most of that comes out of an anxious place, Mm. a depressed place. Mm. Something else is driving that oppositional defiant behavior. And so hold on with emotional maturity. And a lot of times I start seeing it around 11th, 12th grade. Right? That's mm-hmm. when it really starts to kick in. Mm-hmm. So look forward to that. Yes. That's coming. And most of the time we see that happen. Mm-hmm. It's in varying degrees, but we see it. Those are wonderful things. Wonderful insights. Sissy, tell folks who didn't grow up in Arkansas what a bunkin' party is. Well, I'm not sure why everyone doesn't know what a bunkin party is because they should. In Arkansas, for whatever reason, we didn't call them sleepovers. We called them bunkin parties, which sounds way more fun to me. It does. If we're not traveling on Friday nights, I try to have a bunkin party every week with Henry or Wit or both. Even to the degree that our friends who've been on the podcast, Pace and Brandon Murner, last year for Christmas, she gave me the cutest blanket that's a bunkin party on it. I love that. Yeah. And I understand you've added a new read to your bunkin' parties with the boys. I sure have. It's the Explorer Bible for Kids. I got an early copy. It's coming out officially on October 15th. It helps place God's Word in the middle of God's world for your kiddos with the clear language of the Christian Standard Bible translation and engaging full-color designs. The designs are amazing. Kids of all ages can explore and understand the Bible for themselves including fun facts, timelines, photography, and more. Your kids will see the Bible as real, exciting, and life-changing truth. To learn more, go to explorerbibleforkids.com. 
Buy your copy today from lifeway.com and get 50% off using code RBG. We have so many parents that we feel like they've been in therapy, which we always recommend first. Let's get them in counseling. Mm -hmm. Let's do some cognitive behavioral therapy if they're anxious. Let's do some therapy if they're depressed. Let's talk about some things if they have attention hurdles that we can do to support them in different ways. You know, we talk about these different ideas and then if after a couple months it doesn't feel like the needle's moving, we will often say, it's time to call Jerry Fitzpatrick <laughs> or, you know, mm-hmm. to see a psychiatrist. And we have a lot of parents really fearful of medicine. And you can speak to that differently than we can. I would love to hear you talk about maybe when it's time to see a psychiatrist mm-hmm. and why. Why medicine for kids? Is that what you were thinking the exact same thing? Sure. I think this does come up a lot. And I'll even say sometimes you guys have referred people or other people have. You almost think, well, by the time they've decided to break down and make the appointment, they're probably ready to consider possibly a recommendation for medicine. It may come to that. What I find is some people, it's so intense, their fear about this and their discomfort that sometimes they'll come in and they'll start at the very beginning and they'll say, just want you to know that I will never agree to any medication. (laughs) I've sent a few of those to you. (laughs) I mean, it definitely happens. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And I do think, sometimes I think to myself... It's interesting that you followed through, though, Mm -hmm. to come and do the appointment. But what I've learned through the years with this, when there are people that are that anxious about it, they need time, Mm -hmm. and sometimes Mm -hmm. they need more information. In other words, if I do an evaluation and I think, yes, you know, you've been doing therapy, the therapy's been helpful, or maybe you felt like it hasn't been helpful, usually it's been more helpful than people realize. And it mm-hmm. takes a little bit to real, come to mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. realization. But I love it when kids come to me that have already been in therapy, mm-hmm. because I think therapy is a great place to start for a lot of people. And in some place, a great place to keep going, by the way. Sometimes when people come to see us, they think, oh, all right, I'm ready for medicine. I'm going to stop therapy now. And we're constantly saying, wait, no, no, Mm -hmm. please don't do that. Because sometimes if kids are so depressed, I'm just going to give a few examples, they don't have the energy to do therapy. There's a lack of motivation. They're tired. They're apathetic. They don't care. What's the point? Mm -hmm. You guys have been working with them, trying to do therapy, and you just can't engage them in the process. And sometimes they're just too depressed to do it Mm. when, in fact, we see them and if they meet criteria for a major depressive episode or a more persistent depressive disorder, we'll say, we actually think you're going to get better a lot quicker if we get you on some medicine and we can target what we call these neurovegetative symptoms, which are low energy, loss of enjoyment, change in appetite, change in sleep irritability, feeling guilt all the time, ruminating, Mm -hmm. concentrations down. Though all those symptoms go with depression, and we see not every child has every single symptom, but they have a lot of them Mm -hmm. sometimes. And sometimes when you're like that and you're in that state, you don't make the kind of progress in therapy until we can treat some of those neurovegetative symptoms. Mm -hmm. If we can get your sleep better, get you eating better. Sometimes when you're so depressed, you don't want to eat. If we can help that, help the energy, sometimes they come back in for therapy and boy, they're ready to roll because they they start to feel better. Mm -hmm. So you tell parents this, And some people, that's still not enough for them. Mm -hmm. My sort of view is I never want to pressure Probably the only time I really think I pressure a little bit about medicine is if there's significant suicidal thinking. Mm -hmm. So I'm so worried about safety. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to be a little bit more, I don't know if pushy is the right word, but I'm going to emphasize that your child's really in a fragile, delicate state right now. And if we don't try on some new things... Mm I'm worried about what I'm hearing Mm -hmm. from your child. Mm -hmm. I also will say with anxiety, and a great example, and we've all seen this as like obsessive compulsive disorder, which is so exhausting. I mean, kids come in in an exhausted state Mm. from constant obsessing. They usually don't sleep well. They can hardly deal with anything else. And 
they feel like that sometimes they miss their childhood, they're missing adolescence, because all they can do is obsess and sometimes engage in these compulsions. I'm amazed how many parents refuse medication in that situation. But if we can reduce those symptoms 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, and then kids do engage in the therapy process to really work on how to pick up these skills to push away these obsessive thoughts, to watch the face of a child that begins to get better from that, it's amazing. It is. Because all of this is quite exhausting. But we have some people that no matter what you do, sometimes I'll see people and they decide, and I'll say, I really do think medicine could help your child, but I hear you're not comfortable. Let me give you some literature, give you some resources, give it some thought. I'm here, call me back. And sometimes they do call back. Sometimes they call back six months later. Mm -hmm. But you can only present the information and kind of hope for the best. And occasionally I'll see somebody and I'll say, I'm not there with you yet either. I think you ought to try maybe this type of therapy. Mm. And what is true is all medicines, I don't care what it is, Tylenol, ibuprofen, antibiotics, everything we put in our body has potential side effects and potential benefits. Mm. And constantly we've got to be weighing that. And sometimes we initiate treatment and the side effects outweigh the benefits and we have to go back to the drawing board. Mm. And those things happen. We wish it didn't. You know, we have this genetic sort of testing you can do now where you swab a cheek. And Mm -hmm. in theory, that's supposed to help us pick medicines that might be more appropriate for this individual based on a genetic basis. And sometimes it really does help, but sometimes it doesn't Mm. because we're not quite totally there. Mm. This is new. This is new medicine. It's a new frontier. And they're identifying new genetic markers all the time. I think this will get better and better and better, and maybe there will be a little less trial and error, but sometimes we just have to pick something based on symptom picture. If they agree to it, start it, go over risk and benefits, monitor closely. That's the other thing. Kids need to be seen at an appropriate interval if you're taking a medicine. Mm -hmm. We usually want to see kids back pretty soon. And sometimes parents are frustrated by that because they feel like I'm doing these therapy appointments. And uh, But safety first, always. And then we can spread out a bit. Mm. But these are hard. And I have some parents that never will agree. It Mm -hmm. does happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. If I'm really worried about safety, I just try to tell them that because that can happen. Kids can get that depressed. Yes. Yes. And as impulsive as they can be. Yes. In different seasons of life. Or self-medication. Mm. Another mm-hmm. whole topic. Mm-hmm. Yes. With substances or mm-hmm. other things. So We like to end with something fun. Okay. Talk a little about food. Okay. And we'd want to ask you a two-part question. First part being queso or guacamole. And the second part being what's your favorite taco? I definitely will have to go with the guacamole. <laughs> I love guacamole. So would be my favorite. Tacos, man, I like a lot of different. And you know what? Nashville now has a lot of different places that have different sure tacos. Do. I grew up for the most of my life in Maryland. So I love seafood mm. and grew up near the bay. So I love crabs and fish of all sorts and shrimp. So I have to say, I love seafood tacos. I love Mm. ahi tuna tacos, just a Mm. variety of fish tacos. (laughs) That would be my favorite of all. so fun. We join you in that. Thank you. I feel like you have shared such truth as we know that you would, knowing who you are, but with such graciousness and kindness. So thank you. Thank you you for asking me. I'm honored to be here. And again, what you've provided in this community is just incredible in many different ways, mm. including the, the, your camp. Oh, my goodness. It's been tremendously helpful wow. to so many people. And I, I have appreciated the partnership and the communication when things are— It feels like a teamwork Yeah, when it's good certainly. to be able to talk and yes. brainstorm together. And that's another way I think sometimes parents who are apprehensive, it does help when we all talk together. Mm-hmm. Okay, this conversation makes me so excited about how we're formatting the season, which I don't know if we've even officially said. Will you tell them what we're doing? We are focusing in on your amazing book, Raising Worry-Free Girls. Well, and your amazing book, but even each episode, we're going to do... 
a us topic. talking, then we're going to have Melissa come in and do a timeless truth. And then the next episode will always be an expert who's going to talk about that topic. And then appearing in the trenches. We can't wait to bring you all those important voices. I think I want Jerry Fitzpatrick to be my psychiatrist. Just based off her voice, she's so kind and gentle and affirming and says hard things wrapped up in a lot of kindness. Totally. And the wisdom of having practiced for over three decades. We're just so excited to bring you that kind of wisdom Mm. to this season and our conversations around really important things related to the kids we love. And we're hearing a lot of let kids struggle and let kids fail and they'll develop resilience and it's going to be okay. I feel like that's a message over and over that we're hearing, which we sure believe in wholeheartedly. Yes, we do. Hi, I'm Jess Wolstenholm, mom of two and director of education and faith formation for Minnow, a streaming service for Christian families. Wow, what an episode. This was definitely a heavy topic, but as Sissy just said, Jerry Fitzpatrick speaks a lot of hard truth wrapped up in so much kindness, and I think hope. As hard as the topic of mental health in children can be, I was left with a feeling of hope that as we lean into resources like this amazing podcast and the voices it brings us, and we look to God and His Word, we'll know how to guide our kids. You know, I'd love to have a Sissy Goff or David Thomas or Jerry Fitzpatrick that fits right into my pocket that I could carry around with me every single day to help me parent my kids. Wouldn't that be amazing? But the reality is, Sissy and David are way too busy to follow us around and co-parent but that doesn't mean we're left to do it alone. Psalm 46.1 is one of my favorite verses to remember as a parent. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. This is true for our children, and it's true for us. He is very present. That means every single minute of every single day, on the good days and especially the bad ones. When we feel like we're doing things right, and when we feel like we've failed or we have no idea what to do next. He is your very present help. He is your child's very present help. Try saying the verse like this anytime you need God's help. God, you are my refuge. You are my strength. Would you be a very present help to me right now? Please help me and fill in the blank. I promise you he'll run to your need. Actually, he's already there. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to click the follow button in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. To learn more about our parenting resources or to see if we're coming to a city near you, visit our website at RaisingBoysAndGirls.com. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.